Welcome to tonight's Start in Your Yard presentation, a program of the Northern Kane County Wild Ones. I am Amy Lauer, member of the Northern Kane County Wild Ones. A large portion of my yard is native plantings. My husband began converting our yard to native plants 25 years ago, and we cannot imagine our yard with all, without all the year round visual interest in terms of texture and colors, um, and because of the pollinators and the wildlife it attracts. Hang on one second, okay. Wild Ones is a nonprofit advocacy group committed to promoting the use of wild plants in landscaping, gardening, and land restoration. About 18 US states have Wild Ones chapters and there are six chapters in Illinois alone. I would like to thank Gail Borden Library for hosting these events. We couldn't do it without them. Our Start in Your Yard and Community Read program is built around Doug Ptolemy's latest book, Nature's Best Hope. This book lays out a path for each of us to improve our neighborhoods by planting native plants in our yards. Dr. Ptolemy is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware and has written several books linking the health of humans on our planet to the wealth of pollinators and native vegetation that supports them. His book in this series provides information about how to use native plants in any type of yard and the benefits to ourselves and our neighbors and our neighborhoods by doing so. I encourage you to visit the startinyouryard.com website for more information about where to get the book if you don't already have it and to watch the Talmy presentation he gave here in Elgin uh, last year. Also in the startinyouryard.com site, you'll find a complete listing of all the community read sessions. You can register for those sessions that are coming up and also watch the video of those that are past. The Northern Kane County Wild Ones meets throughout the year in Elgin. We host programs with guest speakers monthly, and we also host tours of native gardens. Here are a, a few of our upcoming meeting dates and topics. Because of COVID, our recent programs have been virtual, but we will resume with yard and garden tours in better weather and with in-person meetings and presentations when it is safe to do so. Wild Ones also hosts an annual plant sale where you can buy native plants and shrubs at a very reasonable price. One good reason to join Wild Ones is that as a, as a member, you have an early chance to order plants from the sale before the general public. We sell dozens of varieties of plants. Because you are attending this session, there will be a follow-up email from Zoom that contains a certificate that you can redeem at the Wild Ones plant sale in May. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters, Jean Muntz and Karen Sherman. Jean Muntz's evolution into native plant gardening has come over the last 30 years. Jean and her husband, Dave, are members of the Wild Ones and have been returning natives to their property, which formerly had been a degraded farmland. As a native plant gardener, along with a background in floral design, Jean relishes any opportunity to create arrangements that reflect the beauty of the natural world. Jean is currently dedicated to promoting the Wild Ones Northern Kane County Stewardship Initiative known as Start in Your Yard. And that initiative supports you as homeowners who wish to return natives to their yards. Our second presenter is Karen Sherman. Karen's passion was inspired 20 years ago by a serendipitous encounter with Pat Hill, who is a professional landscape designer and the author of the book, 
Design Your Native Midwest Garden. While waiting for her daughter to complete her piano lesson, Karen was drawn to the colorful and wild garden in the yard across the street, which in fact was Pat Hill's yard. Pat soon became Karen's mentor. Karen Sherman has since taken classes at the Arboretum, volunteered at Forest Preserves, and at the Nina Butterfly Garden in Elgin. And she's been very active with the wild ones. Over many years, Karen has continued to add natives to her property on Tyler Creek, where she resides with her husband, David. Now there will be time for questions and answers after Jean's and Karen's presentation about Start in Your Yard. And now I will turn it over to Jean, who will start. Thank you, Amy. And we're going to stop our videos and share the screen. Okay. Takes a minute to do it here. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, Jean. Well, hello. I know I'm saying hello to some family as well as friends. I'm saying hello to some future friends, I hope, and hello to some present and future native plant gardeners. When Karen and I were asked to do this, we realized the topic uh, had many, there were many places to go with this topic. So we have decided to stick with the following list. Um, we're going to look at some big picture items, uh, considerations, first of all. Um, where to go to look for some inspiration, reducing the lawn, nature's natural resources, the importance of layering, designing plantings, ornamental design elements, and then a brief summary. You see our logo here for Start in Your Yard, but the phrase above it, changing the nature of our impact. Today, we'll take a look at, excuse me, uh, a different way to um, think about making the impact in our yard. And I'd like to say, think that way is going to be reciprocal, collaborative, replenishing, certainly beautiful because it will benefit all involved. For 40 years, my husband Dave and I lived on, I have lived on two acres of land on a hill in rural Elgin. It was on this degraded farm pasture, we built a house into the side of that hill. And to this day, we work at restoring the land, eliminating invasives, some I unwittingly planted myself, uh, and encouraging more and more native plantings. Instead of traditional gutters, we have uh, an on the ground rain channel system, which you can see on the left, flowing into a little uh, pond there. And on the other side of the house, we've designed and installed a system that directs rain off the roof with a rain chain falling into a rain channel, which flows into this dry creek bed that you see on the right, which flows into the rain garden. And when it rains, that water in the rain garden will be slowly reabsorbed over the next 24 hours. Gardening with natives differs in some ways than what we call traditional gardening. Our presentation today will not be so much about how to do it, but more of an offering, a design idea, something we think is interesting or appealing and certainly some info about more eco-friendly practices. We do suggest that you aim for a garden that reflects you and is artfully designed. After all, we want to attract converts to the idea of designing with natives because we know it is a win-win for all concerned. 
we're going to use the definition for native plant that Doug Ptolemy puts forth in his book, Nature's Best Hope, An Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard. A native plant is one that has co-evolved with the other plants, trees, shrubs, birds, insects, animals, soil, fungi, rainfall, climate, etc., that were here in this place before the first settlers arrived. We are talking today about using natives because we've come, become aware of all the things natives do. Doug Ptolemy says, a native garden will be improving our local ecosystems, increasing biodiversity, enriching soil, capturing rainwater, replenishing aquifers, diminishing runoff, creating habitat, and all this will result in an increased ability to draw down carbon. In these next two slides, notice the turf grass in the middle. You can see why the native plants by their very design do all these things we've talked about and create more resilient land right where we live. And here you see a comparison of non-native and native. The roots are the impressive part. Now, some thoughts from Karen. My property is on an acre and a quarters. It's unincorporated, so I have well and septic, another story for later, but it's in the city limits. The front of my house faces a busy street, but the backyard, I have this incredible view. That is why I bought the property and it extends across the creek. This is where Tyler Creek merges with Sandy Creek. When I bought my home with my husband, David, over 20 years ago, you couldn't even see the house because it was so overgrown with invasives, mainly buckthorn and honeysuckle to name a few, but there were mature oaks, basswoods, and some native forbs. So I knew what it could be. Over the years, I've replaced all the invasives with natives, adding shrub borders and forbs for screening along the busy street, shrinking my yard with a prairie island, shrub island, paths, and vegetating my steep slope with sedges and forbs to control the erosion. I'm still doing some tweaking, and it's been challenging, but such a great opportunity. I think the best way to learn about natives is just go outside, get more connected with nature. See natives in their natural habitat. Visit all seasons to see how plants appear. Notice the topography. Most of the city lots are flat. Visit natural areas. Volunteer at a restoration work day, at a preserve. I've learned a lot by volunteering. Attend native plant garden walks. Wild ones usually have them. And I wanna thank Roland, these were all his pictures. Take a walk in a forest preserve. See where colors and textures emerge in the soil, leaf litter, seed heads, trunks, branches, and leaves. Notice how closely together native plants grow. There is almost never bare soil. It's nature's way to suppress weeds and helps insects spend less energy. Books and native plant nursery catalogs are also great resources. We will have a list at the end of the program. And now some thoughts from Jean about sharing our yards. Let's think about how we can steward a yard that is shared with many. When sharing extends beyond human presence, a native garden contributes to the life of many and they in turn help sustain us. When we look at a definition of the word steward, it is, quote, making wise use of the natural resources provided by the earth, or it is careful and responsible management of something entrusted to us. So gardening with natives becomes a relationship, one of reciprocity. It's the other bees, it's the other beings that create the ecosystem services we humans need in exchange for our protection and care. Humans, animals, birds, plants, even the insects 
we collectively are nature. We are interbeings interconnected in a system that we are all part of. We've just seen a minuscule rep representation of those that are likely to assist us in some way. Once again, Doug Ptolemy has helped us arrive at the realization that residential, excuse me, gardens have real ecological potential. Our decisions about what to plant determines the type and the amount of healing that we can bring to the land. But here's the big one. Can we change our idea of beauty from one of a manicured mowed monoculture of grass dependent upon water, chemicals, human labor, to one of a, a garden of native species whose descriptions might be alive with bird song, flowing in the breeze, buzzing with activity, because it is layered, diverse, lush, multidimensional, with intimate places and mysterious qualities. See here a woodland example. In each example, we know it's always replenishing itself, seeking its own balance and replacing what, replacing what it uses. And at the same time, supporting a complex food web. According to Doug Ptolemy, the average city lot is 80 to 90% turf grass, leaving 10 to 20% for plantings. Allow me to pause as you calculate your situation. Might that percentage be reversed? He tells us every square foot of lawn is degrading the soil beneath and inhibiting the natural system that was originally intended. Here is one example of a solution to the lawn's inability to absorb rainwater. This is the rain garden in my yard. During rainstorms, our lawns and our home's other impermeable surfaces create runoff events into our sewers, streams, rivers. So one place to begin is by cutting back on this unproductive crop. Here's a look at our Illinois watersheds. <clears throat> All runoff from our yards here in Northern Illinois is carried to the Fox River, to the Illinois River at Morris, to the point near St. Louis, where it joins the Mississippi River and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. In his book, Doug Ptolemy talks about the Little Garden Club of Wilmette a progressive club in Illinois uses lawn beauty strips, they call it, to define what they call pocket prairies. Pocket prairies or small native gardens can be located anywhere and shaped in attractive contours that take advantage of unused spaces in your yard. They can be small and still provide pollen and nectar for our flower visitors. And here, my dear fellow gardener, Prince Charles, uses mowed paths at Highgrove Manor to guide his visitors from one garden to another. Karen, talk to us about what, what we're going to call nature's, nature's resources. Let's consider that what falls upon the land is a resource. Every fall, endless bags are lined up on the curb Instead of thinking of leaves as landscape waste, they are really nature's mulch, rich in nutrients, shelter for many, and the best part, free. Actually, your lawn benefits from a thin layer of leaves. Try opting for raking the rest around your tree, shrub, and flower beds. If space allows, create a leaf pile, allowing it to break down naturally. Instead of being a neat freak, consider leaving some leaves and plant stalks. One of the most valuable things we can do to support pollinators and invertebrates 
is to provide them with the winter cover they need. Many pollinators overwinter in the lower 15 inches of plant stalks. Wait until late spring to tidy up. And leaf litter is key for the food web that feeds fireflies. Think fallen trees and stumps as opportunities. I had an oak tree fall on my steep hill and decided to leave it on my hill to help with erosion. It will become its own ecosystem, providing habitat for insects as they break it down, shelter for small animals, and build new soil as it decomposes. The same is true for a standing tree trunk called a snag. Woodpeckers and others would use it. A beautiful Virginia creeper vine would enhance it. All provide opportunities for garden design. Removal of dead materials from forests can mean a loss of habitat for up to one fifth of the animals in the ecosystem. This is Jean's rain garden in late winter on the left and on the right in early spring. Keeping water on the land in the form of downspout plantings, rain gardens, rain chains, and rain barrels is maximizing an important resource. By adding native plants, we are adding the deep roots that will bio-drill the soil and guarantee greater amounts of rain absorption. Our friend Nancy began adding native plants in front of her existing evergreens instead of removing them. You don't have to get rid of everything. Doug Tallamy suggests our yard can be 70% native, 30% non-native, and still provide a sustainable habitat. And I do find the more natives I use, the less likely I'm to use cultivars. Do identify and get rid of plants considered invasive. Most common are garlic mustard, honeysuckle, buckthorn. They shade out and take habitat away from, away from natives and disrupt ecosystems. Creeping Charlie is considered more of a nuisance that might show up in your garden beds. Hand pulling is the best way to control it. Also avoid planting some of the Eurasian ornamentals. This is a Bradford pear. It's also called calorie pear. It has a pleasing pyramidal form and white blossoms in the spring, but has spread to form monocultures along roadsides and disturbed areas destroying biodiversity. Others to avoid are burning bush, privets, amor, honeysuckle, the Japanese honeysuckle, winter creeper, which are all part of the disaster dozen that have escaped into our woods. Doug Tallamy says 82% of woody invasives have come from the horticulture industry. We will be giving you resources for excellent pamphlets that list several native alternatives from the Morton Arboretum and other resources we trust. And now Jean's going to share some thoughts on the importance of layers. Let's remember that native species exist in all layers. Here you see the diagram of those layers, starting with the tallest, the canopy, working its way down the subcanopy or understory layer, shrub layer, herbaceous layer, uh, etc. There would also be vines included in this layer. The tall tree canopy layer provides overprotection and shade, of course, but actually moderates weather conditions as well and would also provide nesting sites for some birds. Of course, the canopy king for our Midwest area here is the oak, pictured in the lower right, along with the hickory, maple, and elm as it used to look when it lined the streets in Elgin. Oak is king because it is capable of supporting more than 500 species of cat caterpillar and the others pictured do their fair share. If you are lucky enough to have mature trees, that might be the place to start by underplanting them with natives. And if you're not so lucky, maybe one of the first questions we ask ourselves as native plant gardeners is, where am I going to plant an oak or two or three? The mid canopy or understory layer would include such candidates as you see pictured here, the red bud, pagoda dogwood, native plum, to name a few. Understory combined with the shrub layer provides protection from predators. However, 
Since competition for food is fierce, it also helps the predators sneak up on unsuspecting prey. In these understory layers, one would find multiple nesting sites. Understory trees fall in the range of 15 to 50 feet, and the shrubs anywhere from three to 20 feet. Here's more shrubs, the viburnum in the center, the chokeberry or aronia, and the witch hazel. There's many others, of course. Many native shrubs put forth nuts high in protein and berries high in fat just at the right time for overwintering and migrating birds and hibernating animals. Others in this category would be the sumacs, dogwood varieties, serviceberry, elderberry, all of those would be great examples. Don't forget vines, but you're probably not going to use the one on the left. That's poison ivy. The one in the middle, Virginia creeper or woodbine, as some people know it, uh, is one of my favorites. And then the other favorite of mine is carrion berry or carrion flower vine, which is in the Smilax family. Native clematis, a, a native honeysuckle, and wild grapes would be some others. Here's a great example of plantings at all those layers we talked about. On the ground, you see forbs, sedges, ferns, grasses, ground covers, all providing soil covering and safe passage for little animals, home for some. After a season, the above ground growth will become organic additive to enhance the soil in the rhizomatous root layer where another whole universe is taking place. You didn't see it on the chart, but in the soil layer, there are miles and miles of mycorrhizal fungi connecting everything, communicating and sharing nutrients. Some refer to this vast network as the Earth's internet. Erin has some suggestions about designing a native garden. When we hear about planning a native landscape, especially in a residential neighborhood, many assume it looks like a yard left to grow wild with a total lack of planning. By using some traditional design principles and having a better understanding of natives, you can create a yard that is not only inviting and beautiful, but serves a function filled with biodiversity. You will have less lawn and more plants, which is a good thing. You may hear some ideas to try. I'm not gonna talk about exactly what to plant. Jean previously mentioned several species to think about, but I might mention some favorites. You will hear some ideas to try. A native landscape will have a more natural, less formal look. The most effective way to make a native landscape appear intentional is to, cre to create orderly frames around your plantings. There are several ways to achieve this goal. Paths are one way. Paths provide, provide access through your plantings, creating connections to your yard. They also indicate your garden is attended and managed. A simple mown grass path can add a sense of balance. This is a decomposed granite path that we did at Hawthorne Hill Nature Center. It has curved borders with the bench as a focus. The grasses, drop seed, and little blue stem add nice contrast to the granite. Here is a simple flagstone path with some outcroppings. The ferns and sedges soften the stones, adding to a naturalistic look that is in harmony with nature. The old newspaper trick, or as we say, smothering, layering cardboard or newspaper and adding wood chips is an easy way to create a path. It's also a great way to start new planting beds. Instead of wood chips, just add your leaves in the fall. Another way to frame is to add structural plants. Structural plants form the backbone of the plantings and a framework for plants. This is liatris with the rubecchia. Choose tall forbs and grasses to form a structural layer. Consider shape, seed heads, and foliage because they will provide visual interest throughout the year. 
Choose plants with reliable above ground structure. Most successful structural species can handle the snow and ice in the winter, as well as wind and rainstorms. Grasses are great choices. Switch grass, drop seed, Indian grass, and big blue stems are a few examples. Tall perennials with mostly leafless upper stems should also be considered. There's Culver's root, liatris, swamp milkweed, the echinacea are just a few examples too. In a forest, the trees form the structural frame for the woodland plants. Hardscapes like patios and terraces add a more formal framework. When I talked about that's another story and opportunities, last year we had to replace our well. We previously had a concrete patio that I didn't like and was able to replace it with this beautiful stone patio and retaining wall. The stone sitting wall now frames my hillside, asking, adding some or, order to my native hillside plantings. A common site in many plantings is the wood chip wasteland. A random specimen in a sea of mulch will not be visually pleasing. Instead, plant in drifts. Be generous in your plantings. In nature, plants grow in drifts. This makes a statement and pollinators will thank you for it, making it easier to find the flowers. Think drifts of plants in odd numbers, threes, fives, and sevens. Also repeating plants at regular intervals adds rhythm and variation and creates a sense your design is planned with one vision. If using a single specimen, think of it as an accent. Native plant gardener designer Pat Hill always used a single prairie dock as her design signature. And here's Nancy's beautiful garden again. Consider how tall your plantings will be. Height control is one of the most effective ways for your garden to fit into an urban setting. Notice her simple mown grass paths add a sense of balance to her garden. And here's a single prairie dock she used as an accent. Think masses of shrubs, not just one or two. Plan a shrub border for privacy or a haven for birds and pollinators. And when considering adding trees to a property, Doug Talmy suggests planning for a grove of three or more. The roots will interlock and support one another in high winds. This is how they grow in nature. Trees and shrubs will provide the cover many animals need to feel safe, safe near humans. Certainly the birds at our feeders appreciate the waiting room for arrival and departure. These shrubs provide. My husband actually took these pictures of the Oreo at the feeder and a minute later, he landed on my bench looking in our back window. We have all seen the volcano mulch around trees, a common practice used by landscapers and homeowners. Not only is it unattractive, it does not create a healthy environment for the trees. Mulching in this manner decreases oxygen circulation, actually smothering the root zone, adding too much moisture in the soil, eventually leading to death and fungal growth. And an alternative to mulch is the plants themselves. Underplanting forbs is a healthier solution. Plant your trees and shrubs with deep rooted herbaceous plants, sedges, native grasses, and forbs. The roots will decompose and naturally aerate the soil, allowing for just enough water. This will also protect the bark and root zones from damage from weed whipping and lawnmowers. The plants will shade the ground, keeping root zones cooler. Another reason for underplanting, according to Doug Talmy, is you will be providing habitat for caterpillars that develop on the plants and drop to the ground to pupate. Combine, combine plants as they exist in nature. Choose plants that are able to survive in similar, similar conditions. Consider sun, shade exposure, soils, clay, sandy, moisture conditions, wet, dry, to ensure better success in your plantings. Notice how these plants are interwoven, coexisting together. This is a hallmark of a plant community. No bare soil means less chance for weeds. You can't replicate a true ecosystem that has evolved from thousands of years, but you can design a community of plants that still 
still provide benefits for insects and wildlife. Maintenance will be easier because they all have the same requirements. Think seasonal interests beyond the blooms. Here's the twin leaves and bloodroot and hepatica. You can see why I get excited every year when the ephemerals start popping through the leaf matter and you know it's finally spring. Spring flowers have a short bloom time. The actual definition of ephemerals, some only last for a day. In true ephemerals, the leaves wither and the entire plant disappears, leaving only the underground structure, roots, rhizomes, and bulbs. To add interest throughout the season, you can interplant ephemerals with sedges, wild ginger, and ferns. The sedges and ferns will fill in when the ephemerals, the bluebells and bleeding hearts disappear. I love sedges. They are often underused in plantings. They are great for erosion, add structure, and stay green all year. Notice the foliage of the bloodroot ginger, like the next slide. Notice the foliage of the bloodroot ginger sedges and the texture that the leaves provide. You still can have an attractive planting without the blooms. The prairie in summer, everything is in bloom and grasses are coming alive. Once your natives are established because of their long roots, you won't need to water. Plant for continuous bloom. Asters and goldenrods will provide late fall color and provide nectar for late season insects and pollinators. Doug Talmy refers to them as the keystone plants, which also includes the coneflowers, milkweeds, and oaks. They are considered the powerhouse species that drive the food web and support the most pollinators. Doug Talmy has developed a website that ranks each species by how many caterpillars each species hosts. We, we will include the website in our list of resources. And we have talked about not being a neat freak, especially in the fall. Now, bare stalks, stems, and seed heads become architectural elements in the garden adding winter interest, and more important, providing nesting cavities in the bottom 15 inches of pith-filled stems for the bees and wasps and food for wildlife. Birds rely on the seed heads. Think a multiple season theme when choosing tree and shrubs. Bark, exfoliating, smooth, berries, catkins can add interest beyond spring blooms and fall color. The squirrels have planted a lot of hazelnuts in my yard, and luckily they have chosen well. Life is a cycle. The garden reminds us every season is beautiful. Now Jean will share some other design elements. Well, as we've been hinting, view the unusual feature in your yard, the problem feature, as an opportunity for design the wet area, the slope, the odd contours, the uneven terrain, the boulders, the blank walls, the shed in your yard. <laughs> Sheds can become a focal feature and here even the roof. I bet some of you recognize this little shed located at Bloomin Gardens in Sycamore. Let us not forget the parkway called the Hell Strip by some. On the right, is this not the most crazy, wild, imaginative use of street side space you've ever seen? Add several stumps and you have a garden design called a stumpery. This seems to make sense for shady areas the photo on the left is the stumpery I'm developing along my driveway. Benches for sitting, of course. The bench on the right was built for Dave and I by a good friend. This design is called an Aldo Leopold bench. Every year, I look for these red trillium to peek through the backrest. Places to dine. We'll need places for playing games or throwing a ball. I like to refer to this as a mowed area rug. 
fire pits. There's nothing like sitting around a fire roasting marshmallows. I, am pre I appreciate the impact of the blue chairs on the right. And on the left, taking advantage of overhead branches makes stringing lights an added feature. Jens Jensen, the Danish American landscape architect, architect who was so in love with our Midwest prairie, almost always included a council ring in his landscape plans. The one on the left is located at Elgin High School and it is used as an outdoor classroom. All these elements bring character and a sense of intimacy to a garden design. Richard Dark, in the book he wrote with Doug Tolome called The Living Landscape, suggests that we notice how surrounding trees and shrubs become what he calls the organic architecture for intimate settings. This is a place in his yard. The next generation of land stewards needs to be included in our considerations about garden design too. We can design play spaces that invite them to immerse themselves into the mysterious, creative, challenging, inspiring, magical, imaginative, rewarding, natural world. Don't you love the little one airborne on the right? Ornamentation is all about adding the bling to the thing. Gates, or gateless, as the case may be. Trellis, arbors, bent rebar, bent saplings. I have a version of the bent rebar thing in my yard. For our little friends, and I mean more than just the birds who drink, a water bowl a bird bath, and then adding the sound of water will raise it to the next level and be a magnet for birds especially. Mirrors might be fun. The illusion that one can step through a brick wall or view a scene out the window. Gabion, Gaby what you might say? I guess it sounds fancier and it's easier to say than a bunch of rocks in a wire cage. Here's two examples. Hopefully each is worth a thousand words. Sculpture, of course, but sculpture and fire? Oh my. We're this far and we haven't even mentioned fences, permeable paving, ponds, patios, retaining walls, pergola, rock gardens, pots, urns, places to compost, steps and stairs. I came across these thoughts from the world of garden tours about what makes a garden memorable. Tell the story of the garden. Avoid the look of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting with all the furniture pushed up against the wall or the meatball shrubs anchored in a sea of redwood mulch, we are drawn by a sense of entry, passage through, immersion in. See here how the tunnel beckons us toward, and the curving path allows us to see a bench, but maybe there's more just ahead, just beyond, just around the corner. I'm always charmed by nooks and tranquil places to take naps. There might be special moments like seasonal interest or installation of something totally unexpected along the way. <clears throat> Do the words enchanting and whimsical describe places you'd like in your yard. I once saw in Garden Design Magazine, and you'll have to imagine this because I don't have a photo. It was a small tree 
defoliated and dead, left in place, painted glossy royal blue. No kidding. And, oh, excuse me, Karen wants to show you some encounters she's had in her yard. I want to say a word about the kinds of unexpected surprises we have doing this kind of gardening. When we built our hillside deck a couple years ago, even with care, it had an impact on surrounding plants. But by the following spring, the bluebells had naturalized once again. Natives are adaptive and resilient. Here I had planted Michigan lilies years before with no luck, and one summer they just appeared. Sometimes plants can disappear too. One day, this visitor showed up on my path, probably looking to nest. Snapping turtles lay eggs on land up from the creek. Since then, I never reached my hand into my garden without checking first. Right. <laughs> Be prepared for munching. We all know the monarch caterpillar on the milkweed. The other is the painted lady, lady larva on pussy toes. Both are specialists, which mean they feed on a specific host plant. Sometimes we get help when we don't ask for it. This was a box elder tree down by the creek. This little tree frog decided to swing on my screen door one summer night. And imagine my surprise when I was grilling on the patio and discovered this X-rated show going on. These huge Cecropia moths are generalists, meaning they eat a variety of species of leaves. When you plant natives and adapt eco-friendly practices, you will be planting a landscape that is diverse and full of life. And with the diversity we're going to invite into our yards, we will reconnect to the workings of the nature that supports us and become part of the ecosystem rather than living apart from it. We will start to experience the wonder and unexpected surprises Karen talked about. We can think of our yards as one piece in the quilt that is our neighborhood, our city, and beyond. Doug Ptolemy's wise ideas provide us a way forward, a simple, accessible, immediate, effective, satisfying, profound, and powerful way to begin. It invites everyone's creativity, appreciates everyone's muscle, and offers a reward in, the in return. And so it begins. Just start in your yard. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jean and Karen. Um, so we have a few questions and I wanna encourage anybody that has questions that have come, you know, that you're thinking of, to put those in the Q and A. Um, so one question is: Is can you give me the title of the Midwest Garden Book again? So um, that is Pat Hill and oh. and Karen. Go ahead. It's out of print, but you can find it on eBay. It's out of print, but it's um, it's designing what your Midwest garden. I have it upstairs, but it's out of print. But if I can, you can get it on eBay. I've seen it. Yeah, for Pat Hill. It's designing your Midwest garden, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Um, another question that came through is, is, is sumac a native? The internet actually calls it an invasive. So. Well, I. Others can differ with me, but I, I don't know it as an invasive in these parts around here. Um, and yes, it's it's a native to our area. Yeah, yeah, we're just kind of looking that up. And it, I guess sometimes in a prairie, um, it can, you know, if you don't burn the prairie, it can kind of take over a bit. But if it's a native sumac, it should be fine. 
Yeah, and maybe some of the restoration specialists in the audience would um, would chime in on that. But um, I think you're right, Amy. I think it's more when it invades uh, prairie or open areas. Maybe it's thought to be thuggish mm -hmm. at best. Yeah. And then and then Corey actually answered um, the question. Pat Hill's book um, is design your native Midwest garden. Your natural Midwest garden. I'm sorry. Design your natural Midwest garden. All right. Uh, Sandra has a question. Are sunburst locust, locust invasive trees and are they native or not? Um, too many pods. <laughs> Well, and I have a sunburst locust that I planted because of its bright green color, especially early in the spring. And um, I so regret planting that, even though it was um, a podless one. So it's obviously a cultivar. It had been um, developed to not put forth a pod but those little tiny leaves that are, you know, 100,000 on each branch, um, we unfortunately have it uh, sheltering a deck. So thousands of leaves, those tiny little leaves come down and they, they really are an issue to um, clog cracks and crevices and um, create damp areas. So I do regret planting that myself. Yes. Okay. So Annette asks, when do you cut down your native plant stalks in the spring? Do you do that in the spring or do you leave them and let them biodegrade on their own? I, I kind of clean up like in late spring. I mean, a lot of stuff does kind of decompose, but I usually wait till late spring, you know, after hopefully everything's, you know, the pollinators have hatched and stuff, but I, I wait till last spring, you know, and, and do a little cleanup. But I'm not a real neat, like I'm not a real neat freak. I do leave some stuff, but I do just some cleaning, but usually in late spring. And I do try to, um, when I do clean up, I try to just break up and leave as much of it in the bed as I can, sort of a natural um, compost to it, but one of the great suggestions I heard at an earlier program was um, to, if you're going to break those stalks off, just set them aside somewhere in a pile, and um, you know, chances are the little bee or wasp or whatever in the stalk will will still be able to develop and come out. Okay. Um, and, and actually, someone just mentioned that the Gail Borden Library has the book um, oh. Design Your Natural Midwest Garden by Pat Hill. So um, there's a source for it. And then uh, somebody also said that you can go to bookfinder.com and it should help you find something like that as well. Um, so um, a question is, what plants and landscaping do you suggest for an area that has a high water table? Um, we back up to the Hawthorne Nature Center. Button, button bush is good. I mean, a button, button bush. bush. Yeah, the dogwoods, the red twig dogwoods don't mind being in, in damp. Um, I know at Hawthorne Hills, in one area we take care of, there's... Um, Oh shoot, the name, the- Red Osher, the- The Red Osher dogwood, but what's the other one that just- oh, but We had buttonbush, the buttonbush we had button there. Bush, but there was a um, elderberry, elderberry oh. that's there on the shoreline too. And it, it was knocked down a couple of times. People thought it was noxious and didn't realize that it was a native plant. And so it's made a comeback several times and it's right on the edge. You can look in, Karen and I were suggesting catalogs. There are a couple of Midwest native plant grower catalogs, the Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin, Prairie Moon in Minnesota. Those catalogs are a wealth of information. 
And one of the things they do is organize plants for these different conditions and then give you whole lists of what would work in a given area. So they always have plants that are good for rain gardens or for wet areas. And, and Possibility Nursery too, they have a really good website. It, it, Possibility Nursery. Okay. Um, another question is, is it possible to, mo to move established nine bark? No, well, I, no, I, I, I don't mean that. I, I don't mean no, it's just that I haven't done it. I have nine barks which grow in crazy formations. And so I've discovered they are so tough, I can cut them back to three or four feet and then they will come forth again. But I haven't actually tried moving. Have you, Karen, have you ever? No, I just, I pretty much leave my stuff once I plant it, you know, I just leave it. And, and the deer seem to leave it alone because I have a lot of deer at my house and they seem to leave the nine bark alone. Okay. Um, so how do you feel about pokeweed? Is it native? I know the birds like it. It's, I think it is native, but it can be kind of invasive. I mean, it, if it starts seeding, it will kind of start popping all over, but I, I usually kind of take it out of my flower beds because it can start getting kind of aggressive. Okay. I, I feel the same, except I adore it for floral really? design. I really like putting it into floral design because it's, especially when it's in its berry form, you know, later uh, in the fall when it has those unbelievably graphic colors to them and and the the shape of it and the architectural feature of yeah. it just really excites me can you cut the seeds off i mean so that it doesn't go to seed or something i don't know i i know that it can be is it poisonous to certain animals or something um i i, I wasn't i'm sure. not sure i'm not sure yeah. about that but i okay. think the birds love it yeah okay Someone also just mentioned as an offhand um, that in regards to areas that are wet, they thought that the wild plums grow well um, in the wet areas of Hawthorne. Okay, um, so um, someone just mentioned, it says I like to see plants that look pretty in the winter as well as summer like Minarda. I mean, do you have certain plants that you think that really hold up well during the winter to provide that visual interest? Like grasses, grasses really hold their shape. I have a lot, I have um, the witch, um, switch grass and you know, that really, grasses really hold their forms well. Well, the Minarda, uh, like, you know. Yeah, Minarda. Um, Echinacea, uh, the seed heads of the, you know, cone flowers. The agus, I have agastache that is a cylindrical um, architectural looking plant and that that holds up pretty well till mm -hmm. it doesn't. And, okay. um, <laughs> and even the seed heads on the um, um, uh, black eyed Susans, the rudbeckia, those, those look pretty neat in the snow, I think. And I have the native um, hydrangeas and they keep their form. They keep the, the aberrants and they keep their seed heads in the snow. They, they, they keep pretty well. I saw a comment that Corey said that the pokeweeds have huge root systems to them. Yeah. But yeah. I do know once they get in your yard, um, they're popping up all over the place. So, Yeah, I've had several comments here from people um, that pokeweeds are loved by birds, but they can be poisonous to people and actually to dogs as well. So just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but that cedar wax wings absolutely adore pokeweed berries. So, um, you know, just, just some um, kind of interesting comments. I think somebody else was just saying, you did mention a few links, um, you know, as you went through the presentation is that something people can find in the start in your yard then? Um, yes. Okay. We'll put together, we, we have a list of the resources we um, uh, chatted about this evening. And um, 
we'll have that on the website and we'll see if we can mail it out or have it available. Okay, all right. Well, very good. Um, I think then that I, I think all of our questions have been answered. Um, you know, I just want to thank both you and Jean for that great presentation. Um, as a participant today, those of you who are watching this presentation, you will be emailed a certificate that can be redeemed for the Wild Ones plant sale that will be in May. It's in the city of Elgin. Um, and I would like to thank Gail Borden Library for hosting all of our presentations for, and for helping us plan and publicize the community read. And also thank you to Wild Ones because of your donation that allows Doug Tallamy's book to be sold at such a discount at both Al's Cafe in Elgin and at the Arabica Cafe in Elgin. And for all of you, thank you for attending and please have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.